So I'm Will Fenton. I'm the director of research and public programs at the Library Company of Philadelphia. All of you have probably heard my spiel about the Library Company, but just for good measure, just in case someone hasn't heard it before, we are Benjamin Franklin's library, founded in 1731, but today we're a research library. Uh, we have specializations in all things early Americana, including print and visual culture, uh, business history, political economy, African American history, and women's history. And um, really, the sort of uh, you know life force running through our institution are our research fellows. We give out between 55 and 60 fellowships a year, and those research fellows tell us what's interesting in our collections. And they've also helped me sustain this crazy series now for almost a year, um, coming up on a year, I think, next week. So thank you to all the research fellows who have been supportive of this crazy idea from the get-go. And thank you for all of you uh, for continuing to join me in this endeavor. Um, you might notice uh, that this is a little different than some Zooms. Your camera is not enabled. Your microphone is not enabled. We can't hear or see you. That is by design. It's Thursday night. It's seven o'clock. You don't need to be you know, on surveillance right now. So enjoy yourself. But at the same time, you're welcome to participate. Uh, there's a chat function, which is one way to communicate, particularly if you have um, items of note, links that you want to share, things like that. But if you have questions, I ask just for my own sanity, that you put them in the Q&A thread. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see two overlapping dialogue buttons. Drop in your questions there, because it just helps me keep track of what questions we have and haven't gotten to. Um, my eyes aren't as good as they once were. So with that, thank you very much. And it's my pleasure to introduce our special guest this evening. Mark Boonshop received his PhD in history from Ohio State University and then spent two years at the New York Public Library where he worked on the Early American Manuscripts Project. Since then, he's taught at a number of universities, including SUNY New Paltz and Norwich University. He's the author of Aristocratic Education in the Making of the American Republic, the subject of tonight's talk. And along with Nora, Nora Slonimsky, excuse me, and Ben Wright, he is the co-editor of American Revolutions in the Digital Age, which is under contract with Cornell University Press. Notably, Mark was a Shear Fellow at the Library Company in 2014. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Will. Uh, while I set the screen up, I, I'll, I'll share my thanks to Will, not just for organizing tonight, but also generally for this set of programming, which I've been tuning into um, pretty religiously, albeit on the, the YouTube videos that come out later. I'm not as virtuous as those of you who tuned in live. Um, and I also want to thank uh, the library company in general. Um, my time as a fellow uh, in 2014 was, was a really great fellowship. Thanks to Connie King, uh, Crystal Appia, and Jim Green. Um, and the library company is a great place to do research, but it's also a great place to, it's a really collegial environment. And so um, uh, Will mentioned the edited volume I'm working on, uh, co-editing with Norris Lonimsky. We met um, at the reading room table right next to Connie King's desk. And uh, I think it's the kind of program that, and the kind of place that facilitates those kind of uh, connections. So anyway, I'm really happy to be here. Um, and also I should thank Deja, who's doing all the stuff behind the scenes. Um, so anyway, uh, without further ado, as Will said, I'm nominally here to give a book talk, um, though uh, in the interest of my own entertainment or, or something, I'm going to go a bit beyond that and also uh, talk a bit about an, an article that I'm, that I'm, that's coming out soon that's very related to the, to the book. Um, but to set the scene, I want to just sort of tell you a bit about my interest in, the, in, in early American education and its relation to American citizenship, which is really the subject of my research for the last 10 years. Um, I was, I think, in, in a lot of ways, wondering about questions that are more 20th century oriented, even though I'm, I'm a dyed in the wool early Americanist. Um, I've, I've always been sort of curious about why education was so central to the American civil rights movement. Why was the case, um, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, the case that we all know about uh, as an attack on segregation more broadly, one focused on schools. Um, and then more generally, right, why and how did education uh, become such an important uh, part of American understandings of citizenship? How did access to advanced education become an important um, arbiter of political power? And, and how did the inverse, um, that is exclusion and segregation, become such an important uh, component of civic exclusions more broadly? Um, so those are the kind of big questions that animated my, my research. Um, but of course, when, when this all began, um, 
I, have, I was writing a dissertation and I needed to do something um, manageable. Uh, and so I, I decided to tackle uh, education in the early Republic, um, really uh, 30 years on either side of the American Revolution. Um, and uh, the result is this book. Um, and I'm going to steal the little setup line from my good friend, Michael Haddam, who's actually, uh, I think, on the queue for doing a fireside chat in two weeks, who who described my book as, as about the weird interlude between a revolution that created a republic that seemed to require an educated citizenry and the interlude is bef in the period before they actually created an education system um, that could even come remotely close to creating an informed citizenry. And the title is aimed to get at that. Uh, it's, it's meant to be somewhat jarring if you're maybe in the know. Um, so let me set up Michael's little great one-liner. Uh, thank you, Michael, for that on Twitter. Um, Lawrence Kremen was, is a pretty uh, famous historian of, of early American education. He won a Pulitzer Prize for a book on early American education. And uh, he wrote that no theme was so universally articulated during the early decades of the Republic as the need for self-governing people for universal education, right? That, in other words, the Republic can't work without an informed and educated citizenry. Um, the title, Aristocratic education is uh, is a is a phrase that I'm taking from the period, but what it what it should should suggest is that aristocratic education is essentially the opposite of the kind of education that um, everyone in the early republic seemed to be clamoring for, and that Kremen um, took so much note of. Um, instead of an inclusive, broad-based education, aristocratic education, the kind of education that was common in monarchies at the time, was exclusive, right? Uh, in, a, in a world where the only people who needed to know anything were the, uh, the, you know, the kings and, and the aristocrats, uh, it didn't really make, it didn't, it, they were the only ones who needed uh, an advanced education. And so the, the paradox at, at the heart of the book is that at the very moment that this trope about the need for universal education was so prominent, Americans were actually going about doing something else entirely. Um, so it's not just that some of those really big ideas uh, don't translate into practice, but actually something almost antithetical to those ideals uh, is what characterizes American education in, those, in that weird interlude between the revolution uh, and the origins of public education. Um, and so, that, that sort of the title kind of encapsulates what I was trying to, to come up with, but I'll give you an, another way to frame it, which is um, Noah Webster of dictionary fame um, wrote in 1787, I think a really quintessential expression of the ideal that Kremen was talking about. He said that a system of education that gives every citizen the sort of knowledge to exercise citizenship and to perhaps hold office was not only desirable, but was actually the sin qua non of the existence of the American republics. And then shortly thereafter says, but in practice in the United States, the constitutions are Republican, but the laws of education were monarchical, right? So Americans were investing in education in Webster's view, but the wrong kind. And they were investing in an education uh, for primarily for an elite, which right that's what his callback to monarchy is that it's it's the kind of thing you would see in Europe, and uh, lots of people agreed with that critique, and and so I I picked up on the aristocratic phrase instead of monarchical for one it's easier to pronounce but also more often than not that was the phrase people used, so how to get at this big paradox. Um, well, Webster kind of led me there as well. Um, in, in his critique of what was going on in American education in, in the post-revolutionary period, he particularly went after state governments for supporting what he, called, what he said, in his words, academies. And that's an important term. Um, one academy is pictured on the front of the book, but he, he criticized state governments for investing in academies where people of property may educate their sons, but in which no provision is made for instructing the poorer rank of people. So the main chunk of the book is trying to figure out why that was, right? Why in this moment, again, where um, uh, people are so obsessed with this idea of universal education, are they turning to something that is so exclusive? And so a, a lot of what that meant was I had to figure out, you know, who was supporting academies? Um, what were they? What was their culture like? And, and sort of to give you a basic definition here, um, academies were privately run, usually um, voluntarily organized by some local luminaries, um, voluntarily created, privately run, though often state supported in some ways, um, whether through charters of incorporation or some financial support and the like. And it, as Webster notes, they did tend to appeal to an already well-to-do uh, clientele. Um, they 
offered a sort of traditional education in the classics, what they called at the time, the polite arts. So things like fencing, dancing, uh, modern languages like French, um, even the visual arts. Uh, and so he, his critique is sort of both about who gets to go and the kind of education that the schools are offering. Uh, so you can see one depicted on the, the, the cover here. This is Erasmus Hall Academy, which is in Brooklyn. It still stands. Uh, and so here's just to give you a sense of kind of what these institutions were like. Um, it now sits in the, I think it's a horseshoe of buildings that make up Erasmus Hall High School in Brooklyn. Um, but this is an academy built in 1787. What you can gather here is that these are kind of stately institutions. They're costly institutions. Um, so even in the midst of this, horrendous post-revolutionary war economic depression in 1787. There are Americans investing energy, time, money, resources in building schools, um, but they tend to be these kind of academies. Um, and it, this isn't an isolated incident. Most of the ones that were built kind of do look like this, pretty big, pretty stately, not, not inexpensive to put up. Um, in the 14 states, uh, the first 14 states, so the 13 and colonies in Vermont, uh, between the revolution and 1800, uh, about 175 academies opened up, uh, aided by, again, public policy, lotteries, land grants, direct financial support. Um, that number, though, 175 might not mean anything to you. So in the interest of trying to contextualize this, um, I give you this chart, which is from the Washington Post in 2015 of the most popular road names in the United States. Uh, academy is not that high, but it rates. Um, not far off from University Street, right? And, and I think that gives you a sense for how widespread and how common and uh, these institutions were for a time, um, uh, but we don't often think about them. They kind of uh, disappear. So uh, why? Why so many of them? What, what are the people who are building these schools hoping to get out of them? Um, and the answer I came up with uh, to, to tease one of the main arguments of the book is largely it's a political story. Um, that, that most of these academies, many of these academies at least, were built and organized by members of the Federalist Party. Um, uh, Noah Webster was a Federalist, but most of them seemed not to have agreed with his critique of academies. Um, Federalists were the political coalition that formed to support the ratification of the American Constitution in, in 1787-88, and then during the 1790s rallied behind the leadership of people like George Washington and Alexander Hamilton uh, in service of a kind of creating a stronger central government. But beyond this impetus and this, this push to strengthen the national state uh, from the Articles of Confederation to the, to the new constitution, they were also motivated by what they saw as kind of crisis more broadly in the United States, uh, at the state level in particular, where they felt too much power was, was falling to the states where, in their estimation, the wrong kind of people were uh, were taking power and holding power and passing short-sighted uh, laws. Uh, a lot of the framers would refer to an excess of democracy in the states. Um, and really what they, they believed was that for the nation to function, you needed kind of a more educated uh, cadre at the, at, the, at, the, at the forefront of politics. Um, so to give you just two quick quotations from New York Federalists, um, they distrusted uh, the ordinary men and they wanted to quote, displace from the helm characters who carry every mark of civil inferiority and who do not enjoy the confidence and esteem that the world gives to property and education. So they're sort of conflating men of property and men of education. Uh, but instead, they wished for uh, a government administered by the better sort, uh, people who have had something of a liberal education. So in other words, education was a, a, a tool that Federalists were drawing on as a way to kind of rebuild uh, elite power in the face of a revolution that had kind of been a, a pretty profound challenge uh, to it. But they needed to do that without any notion of, of kind of recreating a hereditary aristocracy or something that really smacked of Europe, because uh, that would have been a non-starter. And they seemed to seize on education as a way to kind of get the kind of person they want to rise uh, and, and be prominent. Um, and so academies became the kind of institution to make this better sort of people to rule. And then those schools were there also to make the case to the community that all of this was good public, public policy. It was a good idea to um, put these kind of men who have a wealth and, and education uh, into the kind of positions of power. Um, so another visual for you here. This is a hand-drawn map of 
uh, Morristown, New Jersey, drawn by uh, uh, Mary Louisa McCullough, who was a student at the Morris Academy in downtown or cent the center of Morristown. Um, and what you can see here is uh, in the sort of the town green on which sit the churches and some of the homes of the more um, affluent members of the community. Um, and then she's got other buildings marked, uh, including other homes. But also, if you see where the arrow is pointing, that's the Morris Academy right there, not far from the, the town green. It's now the site of the library, the Morristown Public Library that holds this image. Um, and the point here is that though that that pride of place in very important prominent county seats and and, and um, well populated towns gives academies a kind of place in the in the kind of culture of those uh, in those communities. So, for for example, on like July Fourth uh, uh, events, you know, academy students would be part of the the main you know processions through town. They would trot out academy students to kind of give orations and show what they show what they had been learning and and you know rattle off uh, Latin orations or patriotic orations and and so forth, um, putting them front and center. In other words, kind of convincing the public that. Um, these sort of well-educated types really should be in power. Um, and the phrase that you'll often see in these accounts of um, uh, these exhibitions are, are that these were kind of students of merit, men of merit, um, and that, that, that they comprised the, you know, a young aristocracy of merit and, you know, the meritorious should govern in the United States, right? So they're trying to draw a distinction here between, right, aristocracy um, as kind of hereditary uh, and something like modern meritocracy, which is really, they don't have the word meritocracy, but they definitely harp on the word merit. Um, and so therefore by saying that, the, the, that these people deserve power by virtue of their education, they're saying it's a kind of merit-based claim to power. And that seems to, to jive with um, Republican thinking, which had put such a premium on education to begin with. Um, and so the kind of discourse of merit and how merit becomes a justification, frankly, for hierarchy uh, under a sort of quasi-democratic guise is an important theme in, in the book. Um, but so too is the critique of all of this discourse, which is that um, what these academies are actually producing is not a merit-based group of people who have just risen uh, to the top, but rather if you take Webster and others at their word, there's nothing um, what we would understand to be meritocratic about what these academies are doing, right? It's children of well-to-do parents who could afford to send their kids to get an advanced classical education in a private school in states like in New Jersey that basically had no public elementary education who were then being touted by their community as sort of future leaders by virtue of their education. And you know, the critique is essentially, this is just laundering privilege, um, making it seem less backward. And so, you know, that is essentially the, the backdrop for where all these come from, the kind of discourse and culture that they seem to inculcate, and then the, the, the critique of what they're even selling is, is where the main chunk of the book ends, and, and I pick up in the last part of the book with recounting the kind of political mobilization against these aristocratic academies, uh, and sort of arguing that those become the basis for finally the strong systems or stronger systems of public education that might hold the promise of uh, creating an informed citizenry. Um, so I'm going to put up a slide now with a lot of text. Uh, please don't try and read it all. Um, but uh, in any event, um, what this is, is a report from New York State in 1812. Um, the legislature calls a committee to, to come up with a plan to organize a system of common schools. Common schools are what we would think of as, you know, public elementary schools, tax supported district schools that intend to serve a pretty broad base of the population. And the report, which is eventually adopted into a law, um, makes a few arguments. The first is that to create an informed citizenry more broadly, academies are not a, a, an option. They are quote, partial in their effects, uh, they just don't reach everyone. And that's a problem because, right, in, in drawing on this aristocratic language, in all countries where education is confined to a few people, we find arbitrary government and abject slavery. They, they're still in the 1810s using this language of political slavery. The second argument they make is for the solution. And that solution is, uh, and again, I'm gonna quote here, the establishment of common schools spread throughout the state and aided by its bounty 
uh, that that will bring improvement with re within the reach and power of the humblest citizen. Uh, so common schools that were in theory common to all, though we'll talk about the exclusions in them in a second, um, were thought of to make uh, possible that they might make uh, informed citizenship actually possible. Uh, so this is New York as one example, but they're sort of at the leading edge of a really big transformation in education across the North and the Midwest in that period, uh, the 1810s to the 1830s. Um, in that time, while states don't get rid of academies, uh, they increasingly invest uh, larger portions of their budget, uh, more of their tax dollars to building more accessible um, common schools. And they do so critically in the name of kind of overthrowing uh, aristocracy and creating something uh, like a legitimate republic or something democratic. Um, and so states across the North pick up this model. Common schools through small districts with a combination of uh, local and state taxes that are kind of locally uh, controlled and democratically governed. Now, even New England, uh, I didn't mention at the top, but New England had the kind of only tradition really of a tax supported education for 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 ordinary people uh, from the colonial period, and even they start to adapt their system uh, in in light of New York's success. All right, and so that's the the basic uh, outline of the book. Um, one reason I said I was going to give you more is to kind of uh, tie tie this to an article I have coming out, and so that's sort of where I want to go next, which is in a, is offers a way to think about what the real long term effects were of this transformation in uh, education policy and this political debate over education in the early republic. So the article is called From Property to Education, uh, Public Schooling, Race, and the Transformation of Suffrage in the Early National North, I think is the whole title. Uh, in any event, uh, it's coming out in the Journal of the Early Republic. Uh, so I'm always eager to, to promote one of my favorite journals. Um, what you're seeing here is, uh, is just a, a simple table the list of northeastern states, the date at which the states nominally started uh, throwing some support to uh, public education, and the date at year in which they eliminated property qualifications for the vote. Um, property qualifications for the vote were the, exactly what they sound like. Uh, in order to qualify to be in a, uh, to vote in elections uh, in most colonies, and then including in most states following the American Revolution, one needed to own a certain one. White males needed to own a certain amount of uh, property and in some cases, uh, black men too were subject to, were allowed to vote, but were still subject to these property requirements. And the idea here was that only those with a stake in society, um, who's who who would feel the effects of the laws they were making, should vote. Um, but basing this on wealth in a republic came to be seeming more and more outmoded. Um, and even if the notion that not everyone should should qualify to vote was still kind of hard to shake. Uh, and so mo as momentum grows in the 1810s and 20s to kind of eliminate property qualifications, people are sort of casting about for a justification on why they can do it. And really what I describe in this article is that the transformation in education that I'm finding in, in the kind of overturning of aristocratic education and the kind of early inst institutions of common education were used as a justification for why you could expand voting rights now, right? In other words, uh, people were now capable enough uh, to vote um, in this kind of, uh, you know, paternalistic vision of who should and shouldn't vote. And I'm going to stick with the New York examples. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm a homer for, for my home state. Um, in 1821, New York holds a constitutional convention charged with potentially changing the voting rules in New York, which had retained property qualifications from the revolution, from before the revolution. And uh, again, I'll get to the quotations in a second. Uh, there were people, many people in the New York Convention of 1821 who opposed uh, getting rid of property qualifications. But this recent expansion of schools following 1812 was exactly what people would marshal in, in, in response to those opposed to ending property qualifications. So the first Quotation here is from David Buell Jr., uh, who argued in the convention that virtue and intelligence are the true basis on which Republican government must rest, and education is the only sure means of establishing these pillars of freedom. Therefore, because of all the, trans the, the work New York had done to expand access to public schools, the state should feel no apprehension in confiding the right of suffrage to such a population, right? Education was now provided enough to kind of expand the vote. 
What's critical, and this is what leads to the kind of tail end of my story here, is that at the same time, New York takes away um, the vote, voting rights of African Americans, who up to that point, uh, black men had been able to vote so long as they met the same property qualifications that were imposed upon white men. And the justification here is kind of the inverse of Buell, right? Uh, as you can see here from Jonas Platt, um, most of the quote, most of the free Negroes in our state are unfit to be entrusted with the right of suffrage because they lack sufficient intelligence. Now it should be noticed that noted that this is malarkey. Um, uh, Black New Yorkers had fought tooth and nail for education throughout this entire period. Uh, if you had to, if I had to guess, per capita, Black New Yorkers, free Black New Yorkers, were spending more money on um, and more resources on educating their children than most White New Yorkers, probably, you know, especially if you do it in the aggregate. So none of that mattered. New Yorkers wanted to take away Black voting rights for political reasons, or certain New Yorkers did, um, and they use this as a justification. And so what they do is they raise the property qualification on black voters at the same moment as they repeal it for white voters. And this is a pattern that repeats all across the North. And this isn't news to historians um, as the vote gets opened up for white men following you know, the 1810s or so, the franchise constricts for black men throughout the North. Um, but what I'm, what I'm picking up on in this whole debate is the centrality of education as a justification for both ends of that, for both the expansion of voting rights for white men and the, the kind of contraction of voting rights uh, for black men. Okay. Part of the reason that this justification is useful to them is, is the discourse about Republican education that dates back to the founding. But part of it is also that it allows them to be very vague about um, their standards, frankly, for who votes and who doesn't. Um, they never, nobody ever is clear about what types of curriculum, what types of pedagogy, best trained, you know, so-called responsible voters. Um, and so they never make education uh, or, or they rarely make education a legal standard for access to the vote. They, they don't widely adopt literacy tests, for example, like, like you see in the Jim Crow South. Um, but they draw on this discourse to kind of justify the decisions they're making. So the perception that they can marshal that education did not take with um, free African Americans was used as a justification to disfranchise them in the same way that the perception that all of this expansion of education had made white men more equipped to vote a allowed uh, people to uh, enfranchise them. So a very important you know, takeaway here is just the way in which educational discourse is mobilized uh, in terms of voting rights and how connected the two become. And the other important piece of this uh, is that black activists are paying very careful attention to these debates, right? So there's an argument to be made that maybe the debates don't matter, maybe the justifications don't matter. It's really raw political power and racism that's at work here. And, and that is true to a large extent. Um, but Black activists seize on the rhetoric and justifications used to enfranchise white, uh, more white voters and to disenfranchise them. Um, so you see, and for example, the first black uh, owned and operated newspaper in New York, Freedom's Journal. Um, there's a great article by the uh, uh, historian at um, the Stanford Graduate School of Education, Michael Hines, who's written about how basically Freedom's Journal is obsessed in the two years it exists with promoting black education. Uh, Cornish and John Russworm are the editors of Freedom's Journal. It folds in about two years, but next, uh, in the next decade, uh, New York sees the publication of The Colored American, which is another uh, Black-owned and operated newspaper. Cornish is still on the masthead, as, along with uh, Philip A. Bell. And in the inaugural issue, issue one, um, they outline our undertaking. We shall advocate universal suffrages and universal education, right? So the, the point here is that uh, Black activists, free Black activists are, are recognizing the, the way those two things are intertwined and they're pushing for equal access to schools so that they can have equal access uh, to the ballot. Now, uh, this is met with a backlash. Uh, racist uh, white Northerners turn against Black education. Uh, this is, and again, this is another part of the story that is, that is very well known um, throughout the 1830s, as you can see depicted here in a uh, uh, woodcut, I think, from an anti-slavery almanac um, white, of a white mob attacking a school for colored girls. Right? This was all too common uh, that white mobs would go after, in particular, 
uh, black schools, but also black institutions more generally. And I think here, what, what, what you're seeing is um, an understanding among these mobs that uh, education is a particularly, uh, access to education is particularly powerful and important. Um, and uh, for those who want to keep uh, African-Americans out of the halls of power and out of having a, uh, an influence that attacking schools is a good way to go about uh, doing that. It's a kind of reflection of the, the shrewdness of black activists arguments. And this just leads to frustration, frankly, among um, uh, even the proponents of, of black education. Uh, here's a, a, a black abolitionist in the colored American uh, in 1838. Whenever black children attempt to clutch the advantages of education, the omnipresent genie of epidermal distinction waves its magic wand and presto, they are excluded, that is excluded from schools. And by this, we are deprived of the right of suffrage on the score of general ignorance, right? They're paying attention to exactly what the justification was in the New York convention to disenfranchise them. And they're pointing out precisely how the, that white New Yorkers are keeping them out of the schools that they're saying they need to get into in order to kind of uh, prove their worth as voters. And so debates rage among black activists. How do you handle this? What do you, how do you respond? Um, to, to, to turn this to Philadelphia and to a project near and dear to, I think, many people at the library company, the Colored Conventions Project. Um, Colored Conventions were meetings of black activists uh, in, in Pennsylvania, New York, and Ohio in particular. Um, it was uh, meetings to just sort of discuss strategy and uh, organize politically um, to gain equality. Um, and what you see here is, uh, is members of the, of the convention in 1848 in Pennsylvania, which was exactly 10 years after the Pencil Pennsylvania held a state constitutional convention that disfranchised black voters, where they are trying to strategize how to, how to get the vote back. Um, and, you know, they say at the top here, we have been advocates of the doctrine that we must be elevated before we could enjoy the privileges of citizenship, right? Things like voting. They're saying basically we bought into this idea that we need education first. Um, but henceforth and forever, we discard it and deny that in the true Republican sense, we need to be elevated before we are enfranchised. And instead, they at the bottom here, they say, if we're asked what evidence we bring to sustain our qualifications for citizenship, we will offer them certificates of our birth and nativity. This is an early, um, not unprecedentedly early, but a pretty early call for birthright citizenship and birthright voting rights even. Um, and it's offered in, in some measure, not entirely, but in some measure out of frustration with trying to use education to justify uh, voting rights. And sort of where the article ends and where my analysis of uh, American, early American education uh, ends is uh, kind of with this table and its implications. And so this is a table that shows you that this link between education and voting rights and unequal education and disenfranchisement was firmly cemented in the North by the Civil War. Um, between the 1830s and the 1850s, Delaware, New Jersey, Connecticut, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Illinois, and New York all condoned legally school segregation. Some of those states legally required it in many cases. Um, and every state that did that, every state that explicitly legalized segregation adopted racialized suffrage rules by the Civil War in the North. All the states where uh, school integration remained um, possible uh, and, and not totally uncommon, including in Massachusetts, in, in which it was uh, decided in a, in a state court case that uh, segregation was um, unconstitutional. Uh, all those states, albeit they have smaller free black populations than some of the, some of the states in the top half of this chart, all those states um, don't have racialized voting. That is black men can vote in the states where black children have pretty much equal access or, or relatively legal access to um, public schools. To be sure, in this period, it's still, education is still being used as a kind of normative arbiter of suffrage. It's not a legal standard. Um, but that close connection between education and voting uh, prefigures a lot of what's to come later, especially in terms of literacy tests. Um, to disqualify voters. Uh, and in fact, Connecticut and Massachusetts both adopt literacy tests in the 1850s to disfranchise primarily um, immigrants. But the takeaway here is that um, what's really important is that the, the Northern men who in many cases sat in these state constitutional conventions who oversaw 
in their states this transformation uh, are the people who are in Congress in, 18, in the 1860s when the United States ratifies the 15th Amendment, writes and ratifies the 15th Amendment, which is meant to enfranchise um, uh, the formerly enslaved people of the, of the South, right? Uh, it provides that the right to vote will not be infringed on the basis of race or color or previous condition of servitude, but that leaves open, as we know, so many loopholes that the Jim Crow South exploits. And uh, the point I wanna leave you with is that New York, is that Northerners knew that. They knew that that was the case. They knew that people could use illiteracy or perceptions of inadequate education and understanding to disqualify people for the vote. Um, they had done it in some measure, or at least they knew the arguments, they had written the arguments. Um, and yet they explicitly don't protect against disenfranchisement on such a basis. So you have here a quotation from a Republican Senator from New Hampshire, James Patterson, who writes that to deny suffrage on account of race or color or want of property is doing violence to the civilization of our age It insults Christianity, but to protect it, that is the suffrage against floods of ignorant barbarism is simply to preserve the jewel of liberty, right? So this connection between education and voting um, persists and uh, it doesn't so much prefigure the Jim Crow South as it provides the underlying justification for why uh, things like literacy tests make sense um, and why those are such appealing tools for disfranchising African-American voters after the Civil War. It seems like reform in some measure to, to some Northerners. And so in the end, um, Americans didn't you know, replace property-based voting restrictions with democracy so much as they kind of replaced an understanding of voting that replaced property qualifications with an understanding of voting that requires education and yet consistently denied equal education to poor and especially African-American communities uh, in a way that undermines democracy quite similarly to how the aristocratic education of the 1780s and 90s also undermined uh, education uh, or democracy. So I'm going to leave it there uh, other than the plug for the books on sale if you want to buy it. Uh, and so UNC has delightfully made it 40% off and the details are there. Uh, otherwise, I'm really excited for the, the questions and thanks for tuning in. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for also like front loading the stakes there. I feel like there was a lot there and um, we'll um, make sure that uh, folks get a copy of that discount code too, because I suspect that 40% off is too good of a deal to pass up. Yes, from. I can type it in the chat while we're- uh, while That'd be you're... great. Yeah, I've been trying to keep up, but I always get you know enthralled yeah. in these talks and then I fall off in my note taking. All right, so um, let me start us off with just sort of a, a, a big capacious question. Um, so the Federalists, they see education as this thing that's going to temper democratic excesses. It's gonna inculcate citizens with Republican virtue, particularly of the landed class. Um, they, they clearly don't have any animus towards federal authority. It's right there in the name. I mean, you have a post office, you have a military and whatnot. Why did it take so long for the federal government to get engaged in education? So the Federalists try. Uh, early on. Uh, there's this uh, Fakakta plan for a national university that gets trotted out every so often. And the idea here was, was a kind of like national academy, um, a place where, uh, you know, the, the promising or something from all across the United States would come together in, in DC to go to a national university where they would learn to be virtuous leaders of the Republic uh, and so forth. Uh, and Washington proposes this in at least an inaugural address, if not um, uh, an annual message, if not an inaugural address. Um, and it gets shot down, uh, basically, um, as it was too easy to paint as aristocratic, right? It's like, it is it's, it's so obviously designed to just bring together, like, the, you know, people who um, would then form this, like, kind of cabal of insiders that would, right, undermine, um, you know, democracy somehow. And, and so uh, Washington has some great lines when he's like, so kind of caught off guard by how vitriolic the response in Congress is to this proposal. Um, and so that fails in, in Washington's administration. There are debates about it. Um, and it gets revived by pretty much every president before Andrew Jackson uh, proposes mm -hmm. it and it gets shot down. Um, again, by people who kind of see, uh, who can kind of leverage the critique of, 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 of it being aristocratic to their benefit, in some cases disingenuously. Um, and then it's really not until the Civil War where the impetus for federal intervention uh, becomes 
you know, strong enough to actually uh, have an effect. Got it. Yeah, All right. That's a great question. Michael Haddam uh, also has a, a question related to the Federalists. He writes, um, early on, you mentioned Federalists linking property to these ideas about ideally educated citizens. And we know that many of the disparities in the public school system are due to its being funded by property taxes. Are there any other remnants of the academy system shaped or continue to shape public, public education for better or worse? Yeah, this is a great question. Thanks, Michael. And thanks again for the tweet. Uh, um, so there's a, there's a few ways to answer this. Uh, so one is, is, yes, the kind of conflation of um, property and wealth with good education and that somehow the two go together. And so uh, it's not, how do I put this, right? Like in theory, if you buy the real Republican argument for education, small r Republican argument for, for uh, uh, public education, the idea is that in a, in, in a world where all men are created equal, the most meritorious are evenly distributed across American society, right? Mm -hmm. Regardless of race, regardless of where they grew up. Um, but as we know in, in like say the 21st century, right? The people who go to, a good example is the, the selective high school system in New York, um, where right, the vast majority of the students who get accepted into the selective high schools that you have to apply and take a test for come from a small number of middle schools. Uh, and right, of course, that suggests that it's because the education is unequal, the kids getting in uh, sometimes are, are from better, more well-to-do families. And so we kind of lose track of that basic argument and, and come to this conclusion where it's like, well, okay, the fact that 60% or more than 50% of, of students at Ivy League universities come from the top 1% is not, is like just a coincidence or something. It's not proof that um, we're not actually living up to this kind of idea of meritocracy. So that exists, this kind of conflation with, because somebody's well-educated that like therefore they're, um, they've earned it is still something that's there. The other thing is charter schools, um, the way in which, uh, academies were privately run but publicly subsidized and publicly um, chartered in the same way as modern charter schools uh, is another uh, important tie-in. Uh, it works differently. Of course, modern charter schools tend to be most common in, um, uh, in, in marginalized communities, uh, but often they're funded by uh, kind of well-to-do uh, benefactors, as it were. And it takes the kind of de democratic control away from the education system uh, in similar ways that academies were not democratically run or, you know, um, in the way that uh, uh, common schools were. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Hope that was yeah. clear, Michael. You can follow up with me later. I'm, I'm thinking about all like the good press Harlem Academy has gotten. Yeah, right. and that's like a very prominent charter right. in New York. Yeah. yeah. Patrick Hayes um, uh, writes, in your list of Northern states um, and constitutional support for schooling, uh, or regarding your list of Northern states and constitutional support for schooling, how do you explain Pennsylvania's efforts in 1790 and the tremendous lag time for New Jersey right next to it, which began in 1844? Yeah, so Pennsylvania is, is the, the oddball one because um, they have these constitutional provisions that uh, members of the, um, Pennsylvania Convention of 1848, uh, 37, 38, excuse me, basically say that they're a dead letter. They don't work. They're, they're, there's means test built into them. That means that they don't actually create universal education. And so the challenge for them in 1837, 38 is that they want to exclude black voters. Um, they know that the way to do it is appealing to who has education or who's educated and who isn't. And yet they're in the convention admitting that like something on the order of 50% of white voters don't, or white men don't have access to public schools because they've done a piss poor job of creating them. Uh, and in fact, they're, they're thinking about like, maybe we should pass a constitutional amendment to, streng uh, to strengthen this system. Yeah. Um, and, and so in Pennsylvania, they have to go through this like insane set of mental gymnastics where they basically end up by saying like, well, okay, if we were to actually make vote uh, education a basis uh, for determining who voted and who didn't, then black, there's a lot of black people who would get the right to vote. And there's a lot of white people who wouldn't. And we just want to dis, we just want to disenfranchise African-Americans. So we're just going to say, basically, we want to ban them from schools and we want to ban them from the vote. And it takes a little while to get around to that. New Jersey is a great example because New Jersey is the state with the most academies per capita in the United States, uh, based on the numbers I could run. Um, so there's plenty of academies. They're investing in education in a certain way. 
but that would suggest kind of my argument here that academies are kind of an obstacle to that more inclusive uh, open form of education because right the existence of lots of academies does not lead New Jersey to be like, oh, this education stuff's good. Maybe we should build accessible schools. They actually take forever to get around to it um, and don't really put anything in place until, yeah, 1844, I think, was the, was the, um, was the law. We have a, a great question here from a practicing educator, Zachary Diebel, uh, who thanks you for a fascinating discussion. He asks, how do you suggest that we as teachers go about framing civic education with the understanding that at its origins, many forms of civic of, of civic education meant to advance some groups and exclude others? It's a great question. I mean, and I don't want to, you know, my, I don't want to preach to teachers because uh, I'm, I'm not one, uh, you know, a public school teacher or something. And so, uh, you know, I think you would know better than I, but it does seem to me that, um, you know, uh, being really um, clear about with students uh, about the ways in which they are or aren't um, being privileged by the education system and the education that's afforded to them, I think is like a very important thing. And, and explaining it in a long historical context is not um, is, a, is a very good way to go about it. Uh, I, I went to a suburban public high school in uh, and, and middle school in the New York suburbs. Like it, it's very it was very apparent to me at the time, I think, um, how privileged that made me, but I also think that um, you know an awareness of that is not universal. And thinking about how right the reason your school might be ninety five percent white, uh, even though it claims to be a public school that descends from the common school system. I went to a school district that's called it was a union free school district, which is a ridiculous term that dates to a New York law in the 1850s about making common schools have high schools, right? Like it, it all dates to this. Um, uh, but, but the point being here that, um, you know, small districts allowed exclusions, right? It meant property taxes could be, you know, consolidated in one place. Um, how the mechanics of that worked over time is not something that was a, a, I was aware of until mm -hmm. well after the fact, but I think, you know, discussing that. And if you're in a, in a place that isn't that, isn't a, you know a, a kind of privileged uh, suburban kind of community talking about these same things uh, is useful in terms of thinking perhaps of solutions right to these kind of really trenchant problems and I think one thing I take away that's like hopeful from this book is that it was really clear to to a lot of the historical actors I write about just what was wrong with right saying education was a, an engine of opportunity and then not making it actually offer opportunity um, what happened when you let wealth and power dictate how resources were spread and who went to school with whom right like they're very clear-eyed about about that and i don't think we're particularly clear-eyed about that again and this go, this goes back to um, an earlier question right like the, what what are the the lingering effects of this right the notion that we can just continue to live with this idea that like yes the ivy league is made up of people who went to well, well healed public high schools and private academies that some of which date from this period, you know, Phillips Exeter, Phillips Andover, places like that. And that that's just kind of the natural state of things. Uh, you know, I think we can, we can think about how to challenge that. So I don't, that's not a great answer, uh, Zachary, but uh, it's a really important question. Thanks for asking. Excellent. So this actually picks up a little bit with the conversation we were having earlier about this sort of national university, it keeps getting revived. And you said it keeps getting revived by, um, by, by every president before Andrew Jackson. Yeah. And Richard Evans asked, did Jackson support common schools? Yeah, this is an interesting thing. There's a great book by uh, Jason Opel uh, uh, called Avenging the People, which is about Jackson's early career. And mm. um, despite claiming this mantle of the man of the people, Jackson is for all intents and purposes, Opel argues, uh -huh. like basically a disgruntled federalist um, in the back country uh -huh. of, of Carolinas and into Tennessee. Um, and, uh, you know, he's he's a lawyer who's like, you know, collecting debts for rich people. Uh, and that's how he makes his fortune. And then right. And, and actually, he is um, opposed in, in, in 1819 to, to relief for debtors and, and people suffering from the panic of 1819 and things like this. And actually, yeah, he is um, sort of in local politics on the side of, uh, you know, being against common schools uh, in, in that period. What's interesting is some of the people he brings into his, his fold are actually pretty strong advocates of common schools. A good example is um, Amos Kendall, 
who is like the fourth auditor of the treasury. He has some, you know, patronage job in the Jackson administration, but I think writes the bank veto, the famous bank veto. Amos Kendall was a common school activist in Kentucky. And that's how he kind of cut his teeth. He was a newspaper editor. Um, and of course, um, working men's parties in some of the cities were, um, ended up kind of voting with the Jacksonians, but Jackson himself uh, doesn't seem to have much um, faith in, in common schools. And I think he's a trustee of uh, an academy uh, at some point. So he, he kind of fits my model of like, uh, you know, uh, bad guys <laughs> uh, supporting <laughs> academies and not common schools. Well, this next question relates nicely. Carla Peterson asks, um, could you say something more about the education of girls? There were a lot of female academies in the early period. So how did girls fare in the common school system? This is a great question. Thank you for, for drawing it out. Um, there's a few ways I tackle this in the book. Um, one is to talk about the, the kind of way in which the earliest female academies are also somewhat kind of top down in, in their uh, structure and in who they uh, appeal to. But they are much more subversive, female academies are, than, than the, uh, the academies for men, um, insofar as they are giving women a path to having a, a kind of political voice that, that they didn't otherwise have. Uh, how, as to how they fare in the, when, when things go to common schools, there, the evidence is a little shakier here, but there's two ways in which it serves their Interest, serves women's interests. One is that somebody needs to teach in the common schools. And it's not a desirable option for um, educated men. And so rather quickly, it becomes clear to Americans that um, this might be an opportunity for women, uh, a place for women to kind of uh, gain, gain access to a profession. Now they're mistreated within that profession, but the expansion of ac female academies actually blows up after some of these um, common schools open under the argument that there needs to be more of them to train teachers. A good example is Emma Willard's famous Troy Female Seminary in, in, in and around Albany is originally justified. She appeals to the state for funding to say like, we will train the teachers for the schools. Hmm. The opening of common schools, um, they tend, the cheapest way to do it is to have what are called women's schools, which I, I always mess this up if it's the summer or the winter, but schools that are taught by women and um, that, that girls attend. So um, there's a there's some good scholarship on this um, that it does seem to open things up for them. Of course, it doesn't lead to voting rights or anything like that in the way um, I'm arguing that uh, uh, men's access to common schools does do. Hmm. All right, we have a former fireside chatter on. Uh, Adam Lotz asks, um, can you share some of the, de the geographic spread of early academies? Were they more heavily concentrated in one region or another? Yeah, I'm going to show you a busy chart from the back of the book. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to share my screen uh, just one more time. Um, Adam's fireside chat was my uh, my first one. Um, so it's good to see you. Uh, so this is kind of busy. This is giving you academies um, by free population. Uh, what you'll some of the patterns here is that um, uh, they're pretty concentrated in not. Um, New England, which is where traditionally historians of academies have looked because uh, because of things like Phillips Exeter and Phillips Andover and some more famous Deerfield. There's a lot of famous ones from New England or in New England, but uh, actually per capita, there's not as many academies in New England as uh, in particular some of the states in the mid, in the mid Atlantic, like New Jersey, but also uh, parts of the South um, where right there is virtually no public education available to, to ordinary people. But uh, where the children of planters or planters are getting the state governments to subsidize schools that effectively just serve their own kids while they're keeping the rest of the population uh, utterly ignorant. So here, here you've got the academies uh, per free person uh, uh, in proportion to the free population of, of each state. So hmm. I'll leave that up there for a second, uh, Adam, but it's in the back of the book. Uh, so go to the Binghamton Library or, or what have you. Um, anyway, thanks for that. That's a great question. Or pick up a copy for forty. Yeah, I'm oh. not. I'm not good at the <laughs> salesmanship thing. Excellent, uh, Nora. Nora Slim. Slaninsky, excuse me. I always have trouble with your last name, Nora. It's great to have you here. Um, this this might be a very unfair question given the scope of the talk, so feel free not to answer. But does the common school academy tension you see in your work follow patterns of educational practices elsewhere in the period, for example, in other countries in Latin or South America or in Europe? Yeah, this is a great question. I don't know that much about this, but um, Nora, we have a, a 
shared colleague who teaches Latin American history at Ohio University, whose name I'm blanking on right now, and maybe you can throw it in the chat so you can tell me so that I don't feel so embarrassed that I'm forgetting her name. Uh, but she's written about uh, some uh, issues of kind of private education in the um, in kind of revolutionary era uh, Latin America and finds that similar uh, kind of similar impulse in, in sort of like private education for um, the, the, the rising newish um, elite that's trying to take and hold power after um, after the revolutions there. Um, in Europe, what's interesting, and this is a kind of fascinating part about this discourse about merit, right? It seems like uniquely democratic and kind of American to us that like they're going to appeal to. Uh, um, oh, thanks, Adam. Adam threw another one in the chat. Um, uh, that they're going to appeal. I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, that, sorry. In, in in Europe, that they're going to appeal to education as like a justification for elite power, and and the discourse of merit becomes actually pretty prominent in pre-revolutionary France hmm. in interesting ways. Even though we tend to associate this as kind of an, an antithesis of. Um, Kind of hierarchy it's really you can see it in europe too as a as a new way to kind of create it in an enlightenment world where certain forms of hereditary power seem outmoded um so that's kind of a half answer to your question Nora. but but we can talk more all right i'm going to give the last word to carla peterson sorry harold we aren't going to be able to get to all of our questions as always is my problem <laughs> carla asks um do we have to look more closely at what education consists of. In some situations in the antebellum period, it was seen as a form of social control to make students obedient, accepting of law and order, etc. Yeah, no, this is a great question. Um, one thing, and, and I'll, I'll pit, uh, uh, pitch Adam uh, Latz's work is in the chat. Um, he's working on the Lancasterian school movement, which is right, this the kind of monitorial system. It's the idea that you can teach like 300 kids at once with one teacher at the front of the room. And, it, and, and there's a very strong argument to be made that like it doesn't work, um, right? And also that it is kind of fits the model you're saying of, of education, not as a, an attempt to, to liberate people, but as an attempt to control them. I think that that perspective is valid. And I think it's, um, uh, it's there in certain schools, and uh, and yet you're right that I I don't spend that much time inside the classroom in when I'm talking about education. I think I'm thinking, I'm thinking of it more in political terms. Uh, that being said, I I also am hesitant to totally buy into that argument for this reason, and that is that um, a lot of people actively tried to get themselves an education in the period we're talking about, and they didn't see it that way, right? Um, free black Americans before the Civil War, uh, formerly enslaved people during the Reconstruction period, fight tooth and nail to get access to schools, some of which are maybe designed by white northerners to kind of control them. Nevertheless, right, they push tooth and nail for this and they find liberatory potential in those schools. The same would be true of um, women in female academies and in, 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 the, in common schools. And I think the same is true of um, the ordinary farmers who come together to right um, raise local taxes, put up put up a schoolhouse, and you know bring firewood and and so forth. Um, and so I, I think uh, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and I, I think we could we risk um, being dismissive of the people we are learning about if we don't take that seriously. So I'll leave it there. A superb answer and uh what a fantastic talk thank you for not only getting to your book but also <laughs> your latest project um that's pretty impressive for 32 minutes well somebody told me you shouldn't get too into the weeds and so i figured well if i just cover more territory i won't be able to um yeah, yeah. well anyway. weeds are always welcome here but thank you for uh coming on and uh please do consider us a platform for your next project all right well thanks for having me will and thanks to the library company and to everybody for tuning in Thank you all for joining. Have a great night. Have a great week.